Hello AP Calculus BC students, Mr. Record here. We're going to take a look at our final video from topic 9.8. And I know that we've been dealing quite a bit with polar and how to find the area within some part of a polar graph. But we're going to take a bit of a detour now and talk about another application of the definite integral, which is arc length. So we're going to look at the length of a polar curve. But before we dive into that idea and do our example three, it's really important that I point out that this seems to be a logical progression. We go from area to arc length to maybe surface areas of revolution. But I want you to realize that this is not going to be covered on the BC exam. So many of the things that I like to do with my students at my school with BC calculus with a two year program allows me to to talk about some things that would traditionally be talked about or discussed in a Calc 2 course in college, but isn't necessarily tested. So it's actually one of the last uh, couple of topics that we discuss in my course that isn't going to be tested. So it says, with a bit of manipulation, the arc length formula that we learned for parametric equations can be transformed into a useful formula for polar curves. And I'm going to walk you through that step-by-step -step process here in just a second. But I want to show you the great unveiling here in Theorem 9.8. This would be our arc length formula. If you've got a function that's continuous and non-negative on some interval, alpha to beta, those are angle measures, as always, the difference between beta and alpha must lie between 0 and 2 pi, which implies that the beta angle is larger than the alpha angle. And then the length of the curve described by your polar equation uh, r equal f of theta between alpha and beta is simply this definite integral here. Notice we're integrating between those two angle measures the square root of the radius squared plus the derivative of the radius with respect to theta squared. And it's a very unusual circumstance here that for one of the first few times you can actually take the derivative of your polar equation with respect, with respect to theta. Now I say that this polar formula evolves with just a bit of manipulation from our arc length formula for parametric so I want to just remind you what that guy looked like. This is kind of going back a ways. I introduced this back in my topic 9.3 discussion and that's uh, something that I want you to be a little familiar with as we go into the next slide uh, because that's going to serve as our segue into the next aspect of this. So let's take a look. The derivation of the polar arc length formula. So here we go. Let me move my little camera up here and let's say what are we going to start with? Well why don't we start with something that we're all very familiar with, the fact that x is equal to r cosine, y is equal to r sine. Those are the building blocks of parametric and polar and, to an extent, vector uh, analysis in our course. And all throughout this demonstration, please be advised that r and f of theta are synonymous, right? r is equal to f of theta. That would be the expression of our polar expression. All right, so what comes up next? Well, we see that if we take the derivative of this x with respect to theta, we're just going to have to use the product rule. We're going to take the derivative of f, multiply it by the cosine, add the f, and then the derivative of cosine is negative sine, hence is why that uh, operation changed. And as I said before, f of theta can be replaced with r, so f prime could be replaced with dr over d theta at any point. Well, it probably seems logical that the same thing is going to happen when you take the derivative of your y equation. You're going to use the product rule once again, and then we can also adapt the uh, prime notation to the dr d theta notation f is equal to r. All right, now this is where we have to recall that that Integra uh, the uh, uh, expression inside the square root for our parametric arc length, <laughs> a lot of words there, looked like this. If you go back to the previous page, remember we had an expression that looked like that. Oh, except I think our thetas may have been t values back when we were working with parametric, but we can make that 
adjustment very easily. So it looks like we're going to have to be faced with the arduous task of squaring both of these expressions and then adding them together. And I know that's pretty rigorous. And that's why I would not have my students write this down. I just like for them to kind of work through this and um, watch it a bit. Um, if you really want to have documentation of this, feel free to take a screenshot of this uh, uh, proof when it's over and you've got it uh, at your disposal anytime you need it. So here we go. This is the big step right here, guys. We are going to go ahead and expand this out. It's just basically algebra. Uh, I know it looks worse than, than I'm probably leading it on, but if you take dr d theta times cosine and multiply it by itself, of course you get dr d theta squared cosine squared toughest part is the inside terms. Whenever these get multiplied together, they're actually going to have that doubling up effect. And that's why that there's a minus two times the product of that expression. And then of course, this last term squared is as you would have expected it to be. Wow, your reward for doing that is to do it all over again with a very similar looking expression with a very similar looking outcome, I would suppose. But now things start to get kind of neat because if you look at this very long, complicated expression, you notice that this giant term and that giant term will indeed cancel away. So that does help us a little bit. And then when you start combining some like terms, you may notice that you can do some factoring. That is, the dr d theta squared can factor out of these two terms, leaving me with cosine squared plus sine squared, and then an r squared can can factor out of these two terms, once again leaving with cosine squared plus sine squared, which is so convenient because sine squared and cosine squared add up to be 1. And boy, does that look familiar because this is inside of the square root of our arc length expression. So, you don't have to know this for the AP Calculus BC exam, but depending on you know where you go to school, of course, my students at Avon High School, we have to know this or be ready to use this um, on our assessments because I do like to cover this just ever so slightly. All right, with that being said, let's kind of move through to our example, the length of my heart. Yes, we're going to find the length of my heart, you guys. I hope it's long. That would be good, wouldn't it, to have a large heart. So the directions are find the length of the cardioid described by this expression r equal 1 plus sine of theta. Now one thing that we're going to notice is that we are going to have to take the derivative of this r with respect to theta at some point. That is part of the formula and lucky for us that's a pretty easy thing to do. It's just going to be cosine theta. Now we can dive right into our formula. L is going to equal the integration between a couple of boundaries. And I don't want to make a big production out of this, but if you've watched some of the previous videos, if you have a pretty decent understanding of how um, a limosone is sketched, we know that those kinds of graphs have a life from 0 to 2 pi. Right? You start at 0, you get your first point, you move all the way around that polar coordinate plane to 2 pi, and that would complete the graph of this particular uh, cardioid, and for the most part, any limosone that we would want to sketch. So you really don't have to worry so much about the boundaries in this situation like you do when we're dealing with area. And so then we know that we have r that's squared, as part of the formula, and then we add that to dr d theta. That's going to be squared. And then all of that is going to be underneath our square root, and we're going to take this integral with respect to theta. Now we have to have another side discussion, <clears throat> because so often the, the integrands that we face with polar applications of, um, of, of calculus will unfortunately uh, not lend themselves very well to being integrated by hand. And this is just one of those. However, this has a very intriguing result, so I want to push through with that. But I also want to throw this into a different light. Let's say that you have a multiple choice question on an exam that asks this very similar question, 
but it wants you to match the simplified integration expression that would depict what this arc length would be. And so you look through the multiple choice options and you see some things that are a lot more simplified than what you just wrote down, but yet you're very confident that this is right. You don't think you've made a mistake, and of course we haven't. So you might have to do a little bit of work to kind of whittle this down just a bit. In other words, expanding out the 1 plus sine theta squared, which is 1 plus 2 sine theta plus sine squared, maybe something like that. And then we have our cosine squared over here, of course. But this still doesn't quite look as simplified as we could get it. Well, we notice that sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1, of course. And then we could add that 1 to our 1 that's already in front. And we have the square root of 2 plus 2 sine theta. And it just so happens that maybe this matches one of those multiple choice options. And therefore, you could go with him. But I want to go ahead and switch over to my graphing calculator here because I want you to uh, see what the uh, solution to this guy turns out to be. All right, so this can pretty much be solved on any graphing calculator. Again, on the TI Inspire, I'll use the shortcut Shift Plus. Note my boundaries were 0 all the way up to 2 pi. Uh, let's go ahead and get that 2 in there as well, okay? And then we had the square root of 2, and I believe it was plus uh, 2 sine, I had to think about there for a second, 2 sine of theta. And all of this is going to be integrated with respect to theta, of course. And then the calculator will give us an answer that I don't know about you, but I find this extremely intriguing in that it is actually an integer result and um, it, it seems that that is a fairly um, <laughs> a remarkable situation given the fact that if we were to sketch this graph and and I can actually show you what this graph might look like in, a, in an environment that's not necessarily going to be polar um, because uh, that's what most of you have um, with the use of your calculators but I do have that nice polar template that I've shown you in some of my other videos that you may have taken a look at so what was our equation again I got to think about it it was one plus sine theta I believe so if I go into my menu and say hey let's graph this in polar and throw in that 1 plus sine theta. This is supposed to be a cardioid, uh, and I'm sure it's going to be just every bit of that. But it is kind of remarkable to me that the distance around the shape turns out to be 8, of all things. So let's return to our document and write that up. Now, I think that it's safe to say that this is a fairly unusual circumstance, and I would like to, I would invite you to perhaps find the arc length of other cardioids to see if that would be the case or if this is truly a special situation. Maybe it's my heart that has this wonderful length of eight. Maybe your heart's a little bit longer. Anyhow, we hope this helps. We're going to uh, close out our videos now for topic 9.8. We're going to move into 9.9. I definitely invite you to watch some of those because that is where polar area can get a little bit more interesting as we're going to use two different polar curves. Anyway, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.